uh, slash on Kranich, uh, whose presentation on whatever subject he chooses, well, actually, it's on uh, Zapotecs and Mixtecs in the United States and in their places of origin. Title has already been sent to the organizer. And, that, and mine is from Shabbat. That would be me, whatever. <laughs> And uh, uh, and uh, and it will be sent to you. And, and he will be speaking at this very place at this very time on May third. So maybe you want to uh, make a note of it. Uh, on uh, April nineteenth, Mark Helbling uh, will be speaking on how political actors frame frame immigration in Western Europe. Always an important subject. And finally, we'll close uh, with a golden brooch as we say in underdeveloped countries, uh, with a talk by Irene Blumbrad, uh, Reconciling Diversity and Democracy, the Process and Policies of Immigrant Political Incorporation. It's very exciting. So it would be great uh, if you could join us then as well. Today, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Professor Karthik Ramakrishnan, who lives uh, at the Political Science Department at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, and considering our turnout, I can see that everybody here is acquainted with his very important research on civic participation, immigration policy, and the politics of race and ethnicity and immigration in the United States. Uh, he's also one of the principal investigators of the 2008 National Asian American Survey. Uh, which is the first of its kind conducted at the national level. Uh, today, uh, he will be sharing a presentation with us entitled Polarized Change, the Politicization of the United States Immigration at the State uh, and Local Levels. We want to welcome you most heartily. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and, uh, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, I'm humbled at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the level of interest. Um, the title I have here is uh, slightly different, and uh, in fact, one of the things that I should say is that if anyone has to, I'm usually pretty good at coming up with labels and titles, but I'm still trying to wrestle with both the title for the book, um, uh, which you see here, that's a tentative title, and also for the model that I'm going to sketch out. I'm not wedded to any of these particular labels. If someone has some better ideas, I'd be glad to hear it. Um, and if you don't have a chance to, uh, uh, if you don't have too much time for discussion today, just email me, karthik at ucr.edu, um, or, uh, or I'll give you my phone number if you want to talk about something. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I think we just have an hour total, right? If you deliver a 40-minute presentation, we'll have plenty of time. Okay. Okay. I'll just say a little bit about uh, how I got to this topic. So most of the work that I do the, I mean, so I, I, I did my um, graduate work here at, at Princeton and, and uh, started off doing work on political behavior and civic participation. So that's what I started my research trajectory on. Um, after that, after being here, I went to work at the Public Policy Institute of California, and there I was starting to think more about policy issues, and that's how I got interested in this topic of local governments and what they do or don't do uh, with respect to immigrant incorporation. Now, this was back in the early aughts, I guess, in, in 2002 and 2003. And so back then, the discussion was, you know, what are lo local governments doing to try to integrate immigrants? And, and what I did there was to do a study that involved a survey of immigrant destination cities in California. Um, and California being what it is, you have about 300 cities where, uh, where about one in six residents is, is foreign born. Uh, this was as of the 2000 census. So we did a survey of, uh, elected of government officials in these cities. So we surveyed city council members, mayors, police chiefs, and planning directors. We focused on police chiefs and planning directors, one, because of potential issues with, in terms of community police relations involving immigrants. Um, in terms of planning directors, this involves land use, but also issues such as overcrowded housing, which even then people were saying was more likely to be the case in immigrant-heavy neighborhoods. One of the things we wanted to find out is how good are these cities in terms of considering the needs uh, and addressing the concerns of immigrant residents, how much language access do they provide, what kind of avenues to political power are there for immigrants, and largely the story was a fairly depressing one. Um, even though, and I should say we also did case studies in four cities in California, some qualitative work to kind of 
help add some flesh to the statistical findings. And generally speaking, and this report is, um, you can find it on my website or, uh, or on the PPIC website, um, we generally found that even in these immigrant destination cities, when you go outside the very large cities, like Los Angeles, like San Jose, um, like uh, Santa Ana, there's not much that's going on. Um, even though, I mean, and this is where you have this disconnect. This ties into some of the research that, I'm, that I've done with Irene Blumrad, uh, too, which you, you have this disconnect between an increasing vibrancy in immigrant civic associational life, but a disconnect between uh, the avenues of power and what's going on within immigrant communities. Um, so, uh, you know, but in, we have the strong contrast. On the one hand, you have the Rotary Club and the Lions Club that are still very much powerful when it comes to local politics. Um, you know, we typically think of employee unions as being very strong, but in most of these suburban cities, they, they're not strong, they don't exist in many of these places. Um, but by contrast, immigrant uh, heavy uh, civic associations are not politically powerful. So that's what we found, but generally the thrust was, what can cities do to be more welcoming, more integrative? Uh, so that report came out in 2005. Um, a lot has changed since then. Right? So the entire angle has shifted uh, in, into now when you're looking at how immigrants are being treated at the local level and the state level, it's mostly to figure out who, uh, who is doing what to, um, to, to uh, hurt immigrants, I guess to put it most bluntly. Uh, you've seen a rise in restrictive efforts, um, first at the national level, uh, as many of you know, uh, in December 2005, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, passed uh, a, a bill known as H.R. 4437. It's one of these few instances where a, uh, a bill number itself becomes enshrined in the, in the national imagination, especially among Latino immigrants. Um, soon after this passed, you had a massive wave of protests uh, in uh, early 2006. In 2006, you also had attempts at comprehensive immigration reform, and it failed. It also failed in 2007 when they tried again. Now, in addition to this national picture, you also saw a spike in involvement in uh, local involvement in immigration enforcement. Again, here's another number, uh, part of the immigration code that typically would not get much notice, but this is a program that, that allows cooperation between the federal government and uh, state and local law enforcement authorities uh, through this provision called 287G, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, and we can talk about it in the q now, in addition to this, this federal state program, you saw the rise of local legislation uh, after 2005. Uh, the first and most prominent one was in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. A play, again, a place you would never have heard of, except for the fact that it passed this thing and got on the Lou Dobbs show uh, several times. Uh, soon after Hazleton passed this ordinance, you had Valley Park, Missouri, and former Branch, Texas, passing legislation that looked <coughs> nearly identical, very similar, quite sophisticated, uh, in terms of uh, wording it in such a way to potentially pass constitutional muster. Hazleton right now has, is being getting kicked around up and down the, uh, the, uh, the circuit courts. Uh, it will probably make it to the Supreme Court. Uh, as you might know, Arizona's SB 1070 uh, is going to have oral arguments uh, on that um, next, next week, April 25th. And hopefully the uh, federal government will have a better argument than the kind of oral arguments they, they made. Uh, the healthcare law. Um, but anyway, the kind of legislation at the local level involved restrictions on businesses that have contracts with the city. So if, if you have a contract with the city, you need to uh, either engage in E-Verify or some other program to make sure you're really not knowingly hiring illegal immigrants. Um, then you also have, Hazleton hits all of these, by the way. It also affected businesses that have, license, that have licenses to operate in the city. Right? So even if you don't have a contract with the city, it would still be affected. Uh, you've also had landlord ordinances that would compel landlords to check on the legal status of their tenants. Uh, and then day labor ordinances. And I see that Abel is in the room. It's very fortunate to have them here. Uh, you've had various attempts to try to clamp down on informal day labor. <coughs> in addition to the local level, you saw a rise in state legislation after 2004. So before 2004, there was not much going on. And there was so little going on that the National Conference of State Legislatures didn't even track this. But starting in 2005, they started tracking it because you start to see, see a rise in the state legislature. So uh, most famously, we think of Arizona and Alabama now, but Oklahoma was a state that passed an ominous, ominous bill a few years ago. Mississippi looks like it's on the verge of passing something. North Carolina, the list goes on. Um, 
Here, too, you see some similarities. Uh, Arizona in 2004 passed the Legal Arizona Workers Act, uh, which, would, uh, which basically imposed E-Verify on any businesses that have a license in the state. Um, you've also had attempts to um, do more on the enforcement side, and this is what Arizona's SB 1070 does. It goes beyond what is, uh, what is granted to different law enforcement authorities within the state of Arizona under the 287G program. So the central question of my book uh, is why did we see a spike in state and state of local involvement in the last decade, and what accounts for its variation across space? Right? Why do some places do it, some places don't? Um, and I'll just cut, kind of cut to the chase. The major way I'm framing this argument um, is that economy-centered explanations and cultural threat explanations don't go very far. Now, it's very appealing, and this is something, you know, sometimes when I present this stuff, people say, this is just a straw person argument, right? I mean, do we really believe this? But, you know, there are many people, including many sociologists and some political scientists who continue to believe this because there's a strong research tradition in, at least not strong, but I guess growing and increasingly strong research tradition in new and emerging destinations. And the kind of, the almost logical consequences of that is that you have immigrants moving to new areas. It's not just in the traditional destinations. And it's almost inevitable that you have some kind of conflict, either based on economic competition or people unused to having Spanish speakers around or overcrowded housing. Uh, cars being parked on lawns, all of these negative things that are associated with uh, immigrants coming in. What I argue instead is that, uh, what I argue instead is, 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 is for a, political, a largely political account. Uh, one that takes into account the role of historical developments and federalism. Uh, so I, I note that federalism, especially what happened in 1996, set the stage for what we're seeing today, uh, but it wasn't determinative. Similarly, Party polarization also matters, uh, and the rise of ethnic nationalism, I need to come up with a better term for that, someone told me recently, but this new form of ethnic nationalism post 9-11, in which the border becomes a central part of national security. Uh, that also plays a role, but I argue that these are all important contextual factors. Party polarization and the rise of ethnic nationalism post 9-11 serve as important opportunities, but issue entrepreneurs play a very critical role uh, in, in taking advantage of these opportunities. What I'll argue is that this political account is superior, if you will, to the other accounts in terms of accounting for some of these developments over time and across space, and also to account for both national level, level developments and uh, subnational developments. So these are all the good things going for it. I'm sure everyone here will, will figure Can out holes. Can you explain issue entrepreneurship a little bit more clearly? I will, I will in a second, yeah. When I, when I uh, go over my mind. So the sketch of the argument is that federalism, uh, developments of federalism starting in 1996 set the stage, but there was no immediate effect uh, in terms of states and localities playing a more central role on immigration. And then, starting in 2000, and this is turning to the national level, you had the hopes for bipartisan legislation uh, with uh, George W. Bush coming to the White House, talking about immigration reform, inviting Vicente Fox for the state visit, that was on September 4th, 2001, right? Mm -hmm. And then September 11 happens, and all bets are off, right? But even before 9-11, you have Tom Tancredo going on TV opposing this so-called amnesty that the Bush administration was pushing. Mm -hmm. And Tancredo, in many ways, is the kind of grandfather of the Tea Party. He was Tea Party before there was a party, right? mm -hmm. So he goes on television and has no problem attacking the administration. Yeah. An administration that is famously intolerant of, of dissension within the ranks. Uh, and he does it starting in 2000 and continues to build the Immigration Reform Caucus in the House and, and gives them a lot of trouble even on some relatively minor provisions before comprehensive immigration reform comes down the pike. 9-11 also diverts attention from immigration to, uh, to um, the Afghanistan war, later the, uh, the Iraq war, but it also favors restrictionists as I'll, as I'll argue briefly. Um, Bush in 2000, when he gets re-elected, well, as he's seeking re-election, is another key moment. So in 2004, uh, during the primaries, he again floats the trial balloon idea of, of, of an amnesty. Uh, he doesn't call it amnesty, of course, but conservative uh, radio and the Dobbs and others go nuts. Uh, and so again, you see a kind of Tea Party-like effort while Bush is running for re-election. And certainly after he wins re-election, I argue that this is an important institutional moment and one that's not appreciated. 
Bush instantly becomes a lame duck. Not only because he, he's not going to run for re-election again, but Cheney says he's not going to run. Right? So this is when already you had attacks against the party establishment on immigration in the first term, but in the second term it was open season. Uh, and again, the Tea Party kind of does this in a, in a very big way starting in 2008 uh, in terms of the fight for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. Throughout, I argue that issue entrepreneurs play a key role, and they play a key role um, not only in these national efforts that modern Republicans and, and Democrats favor, um, so they grind the process to a halt at the federal level, but this is almost like, you know, you hear about the, the definition of chutzpah, right? It's like, so they grind it to a halt at the federal level, and they turn around and say, look, the federal system is broken. We've got to do something at the state level. Right? Clearly, they don't want any solution at the federal level. They want a particular solution. And so part of the plan is to make sure that there is nothing that happens at the federal level. Anyway, so that's the sketch of the argument. I, what, I argue, what I think the book does, I think some of the major selling points, is that it challenges the conventional model of demographic change. Um, so as I will argue that demographic change is, is not sufficient, you have tens of thousands of municipalities in this country that are diversifying, but only about a hundred that have either considered or passed anything that is restrictive on it. So it's not sufficient if you want to use that kind of deterministic logic. I think it's good for kind of persuasion purposes. But I also do some statistical research, right? So it's not sufficient, nor is it necessary. So you've had a bunch of municipalities in central Pennsylvania that say, we don't want immigrants here. But there are no immigrants there to begin with, right? So they're trying to kick out immigrants that don't exist. Um, so it's neither, uh, neither sufficient nor necessary. <coughs> Put most bluntly, uh, and I think maybe controversially for the group here, um, is that the problem is not that immigrants are moving to new destinations. The problem is that they're moving to Republican destinations. Because these are the areas that are most ripe for political action. Mm -hmm. So I showed through statistical means that partisanship matters, but why and how? To do that, what I'll walk you through is this new model uh, of polarized change. Uh, maybe that will be the title of the book, I'm not sure. Uh, and that's a dynamic model, and I'll go over that uh, very shortly. Uh, and then finally, I think there's some important theoretical implications and some substantive implications for immigrant rights uh, as well. And, uh, and I think that might need to be a Q&A kind of discussion. Okay, so the conventional model uh, is what I would call something like a pressure cooker model, right? So you have immigrants moving to these new destinations, and they're causing, they're causing problems. So there are all these policy challenges that are bubbling up. This is from the conservative point of view, right? So there are all these challenges that are boiling up from below. And at the same time, you have federal inaction. So you have a cap on the pressure cooker on top. And so you need to, so these localities need to blow off steam. So states and local governments are doing whatever they can to address these very real problems uh, that are happening at the state and local. So this conventional model is something that is shared by advocates. It's not just shared by, by scholars, but also advocates and elected officials on both sides. And I, I love this picture to, to illustrate it. So this is, a, this is an iconic moment when, when Obama was visiting uh, Arizona and Jan Brewer greeted him uh, on the tarmac. Right? So in this picture, they don't look like they would be agreeing on much. But in fact, if you look at the language that they use, when you look at what Brewer said when she signed the law, and what the president said after the law was signed, there's similar language saying that the federal system is broken, and it's understandable why states are doing this. Now, President Obama doesn't think it's a good idea for them to be doing this, uh, and Jan Brewer thinks it's a great idea for them to be doing this, but there's a common uh, sense that there are some real problems happening, and federal inaction is, is, is part, of, uh, part of why what, this is happening. This is also in line, as I said, in terms of uh, some of the scholarship on new destinations. Um, you've had significant news coverage uh, on this, um, especially when places like Hazleton were, were considering and passing uh, this legislation. You had a lot of reporters that had never heard of it, so spent some time in these places, and you had this narrative that emerged of kind of the newness of immigration and how that's causing all sorts of tensions. And then finally, there's some scholarship on uh, immigration ordinances. Um, both uh, in sociology, uh, Jill Espenshade, uh, Christina Rodriguez is a law professor who, you know, I mean, I thought that functionalism was something that you don't really see much of these days, but she argues for a functionalist account for, uh, for, for why uh, localities are, are passing uh, this type of legislation. And finally, Dan Hopkins has a more nuanced account in which demographic change matters, 
but it's when uh, national media pay attention to immigration and increase the salience. I think that Dan's account is good in terms of talking and thinking about how you have, he, he calls it a politicized change model. Um, but it's mostly a media-driven account. There's not much uh, in terms of institutions and actual policies that are, that are part of that model, and that's something that I, that I hope to do and what I have here. So in terms of testing the conventional model, uh, there are different ways that you could try to measure this systematically, and especially <coughs> the when you look at localities, you, there, there are some limits to what you can measure to figure out what the potential for policy challenges are. So you, you can look at how recent the immigration is, you can look at the growth of the foreign born, um, you know, either between uh, 1990 and 2000, or 2000 and 2010. You can look at the proportion of Spanish dominant households uh, in the area, uh, the proportion of households that are overcrowded. Uh, you can look at economic stress indicators, poverty levels among whites and blacks, or maybe the relative poverty of whites and blacks compared to Latinos uh, in the area. So there are different ways that, that we could try to figure out uh, these local challenges. Just to cut to the chase, this is, this is, this is a graph uh, showing the uh, predicted effects looking at about 25,000 localities in the country. First of all, it's a, it's a pretty rare occurrence. And what you find is that most of these demographic factors have no predictive power uh, when it comes to the passage or proposal of these restrictions. <coughs> what does pop out as, as significant are two factors. One is whether it's a Republican majority area. And two, how important agriculture is to the local labor market. Now, some of them might say that's a demographic factor, but I would argue that it's, that it's a political factor. This is, this is on the passage. Okay. One thing I should note is this agricultural jobs factor is not significant on the proposal of restrictive legislation, but it does show up on the passage. So what that means to me is that the, the, there is this kind of letting off steam element, maybe, Right, so it's it largely has symbolic value, but if it if it hurts local economic interests, they will mobilize to prevent uh, to prevent these laws from, from from being instituted. So that's at the municipal level. You have very similar results uh, at the state level, and in fact, the partisanship uh, findings are even stronger. They're also measured better. It's really hard to get locality-based partisanship mm -hmm. information in the U.S. So I've had to rely on county measures. And you know there are problems with that, uh, but it still su suggests that you know, being in a Republican county, being in a Republican area, uh, is significant. I've gotten access to some more fine-grained partisanship data than I, I can. <coughs> but anyway, it also uh, these findings also hold true at the state level, and there are different different models that I've run. Uh, and initially, I used uh, 2000 census data. Uh, we can't use 2010 census data for many of the things I'm looking for, so I use the uh, five-year ACS, um, but no matter what, even if you measure the DV in, in different ways, generally you find that partisanship uh, matters more and matters consistently uh, across the state. So, so in one chapter of my book, I'm going to do that, right? So it builds upon other work that I've done, kind of updates it to show that partisanship matters. But the question is, how, does, how do these local partisanship contexts matter? I think one way that I can help kind of put some flesh on that is to talk about some of the mechanisms how this works at the local level. I can't do it in all of these places, but I can show some illustration and the potential pathways, I've identified three potential pathways. One is political ambition. So these are people like the mayor of Hazleton who gets on Lou Dobbs and that helps his political career. Uh, he runs for Congress once and fails, but then he runs again and he wins uh, uh, in an open seat. So actually not open seat, he, he defeats a, a, a Democratic so, that, so that's a political ambition story. People who kind of ride the immigration issue for, for more general political notoriety. <laughs> then you have the single issue advocates that are not necessarily interested in political office themselves, um, but who care intensely about immigration. For whatever reason, either something happened in their life or they were just born that way, and they care <laughs> intensely about this issue, and they'll continue to push it, even if it's politically uh, not attractive, right? Even if it means that their party will lose, they will continue to push it. And then finally, you have party activists. And this is something that, you know, I, I, I'm just going to kind of take it as a given. I think there's a lot to unpack in terms of why Republican Party activists care so intensely about immigration, why they care so early about it, enough to kill moderates in primaries or threaten to kill them in primaries. 
Uh, but that's something that that's part of this uh, part of this explanation. But then, you know, in this book, I thought, let me try to do something more ambitious. Let me try to stretch it back and take it to the national level and present this this model that I'll show you. And so, what I have here is this polarized change model. As I as I said, federalism sets the stage, and things like party polarization matter, but other factors matter as well. I'll get to that model diagram in a second. In terms of federalism, let me just say that 1996 was a key moment. So it was a key moment because you had welfare reform that encouraged states to experiment in terms of what kind of benefits they would grant to not just undocumented immigrants, but even legal permanent <coughs> residents, and what they would not. Right? So, so you had this uh, invitation for the states to, to do more policy experimentation. At the same time, you also had immigration reform that passed that year. Uh, and it should be noted, it was passed under a uh, Democratic president, who was fearful of Bob Dole as a challenger. I mean, this is kind of like, in hindsight, you think, really? <laughs> <laughs> but this is coming off the heels of Proposition 187 in California in 1994. And so not only was, was this law, I mean, this law has been in study and its consequences in various ways. You had this massive buildup uh, at the border. You had this diversion of the migration stream through Arizona, formerly through California and, and parts of Texas. Um, but you also had other important provisions made it easier to deport individuals and also to exclude them from the United States. This is the first time you had this 10-year exclusion rule, that if you were removed from the country, you could not legally re-enter for another 10 years. But for federalism, what was important was this provision, uh, uh, this 287G provision that didn't get much notice at the time. So it was passed, it was called a force multiplier, right? So you had a limited number of INS agents at the time, and, and, and uh, border patrol agents. And so this was a way to have more hands on deck. Um, and this is the kind of argument that Arizona is going to use. Because, because uh, Joe Arpaio, for instance, the sheriff of Maricopa County, uh, until recently had, was under the most kind of the fullest version of 287G, in which he had a lot of latitude to basically serve as an agent of the federal government when it came to immigration enforcement. But then one thing that's important to note about 287G and that the that Department of Justice will say is that this is something that the federal government can, can grant and revoke. It's not something that a locality can just decide to do uh, all by itself. But again, it didn't get much notice. But if you look at the number of places that were participating in 287G, so this is a, this is a provision that was passed in 1996. But there's almost no action until 2005, right? So why is, so why is 2005 and 2006 important? This is where I think some of the economic arguments, you know, strain a little bit of credibility, right? Because if it, if you think it's times of economic downturn that you'll see this massive uprising and, and these localities doing things, 2005, 2006, and even 2007 were pretty boom times. Very tight labor market, right? Not much economic competition underway, not much economic stress. So that doesn't account for why it becomes popular all of a sudden. Uh, I argue on this, and I'll, and I'll walk through my politicized argument, that things like what was happening in Congress at the time and the massive immigration rallies that, that followed created a politicized environment that, that made uh, 287G more appealing to localities. It also made it more appealing to the federal government who wanted to show that they were serious about enforcement. Right? Part of comprehensive immigration reform is to show that you're serious and credible on enforcement <coughs> so that you can pass the legalization provisions as well. Not to interrupt, but I think there are people here who don't know too much about 287G. So 287G is, is a program where um, the federal government agrees, it enters into a, a memorandum of understanding with local jurisdictions, so usually sheriff's departments, sometimes with state police departments as well, very rarely with city police departments, um, to they basically train them to, to be able to identify people you know, in terms of whether they have a legal right to be in the United States or not, and to facilitate their deportation. Now, that is different. Deputized. Yeah, they're deputized by the federal government. That's different from this new program that is rolling out called Secure Communities, mm -hmm. where it's essentially a fingerprint check before they would have checked it against the FBI crime databases. Now they, they, they check it against immigration databases to, to see if someone is le legally permitted to be in the United States or not. And if, if there's some kind of flag or an error, they, uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement can put a hold, they can put a detainer to say, yes, we're interested in this individual, hold them right there, and then they will come and, and process them. But that's, 
The thing about 287G is that it is something that a local jurisdiction applies for, and the federal government can decide whether or not it wants to grant it. Secure communities, localities have no choice. Some of them were told that they had the choice, but in fact, uh, states have been just included into that system as it's been rolled out. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep going. But unless it's, is it on the 287G? I was just wondering um, which in the upcoming Supreme Court case is being questioned. So let's take that for the Q&A. <laughs> yeah. It's not a 287G program. Um, so, so in addition to federalism setting the stage, someone could say, you know, it's just party polarization. Issue, what I would argue for issue entrepreneurs, they don't really play that much of a role. So certainly, you had an increase in party polarization after Bush v. Gore. So maybe it makes sense that immigration becomes caught in the trap of partisan politics. Because what you see before, um, is in 1986, you had a fair number of Republicans in the House that supported amnesty, right, that a Republican president signed. So you've had these bipartisan efforts. And in 1996, it actually went the other way. You had a bipartisan attempt at restrictionist legislation, right, passed at the federal level. So it's possible that you could have had it even post Bush v. Gore because you had bipartisan legislation on the which I left behind, on the Bush tax cuts, on the Iraq war resolution, and not to say that these are good things, but you had, you had these compromises uh, that, that, that took place where you had uh, bipartisan majorities that passed it uh, and a president that signed it. What I argue is that issue entrepreneurs made the key difference in making sure that 2006 and 2007 did not look like 1986. They played a very key role, especially in killing the moderate Republicans on, on immigration reform. And that's, one of, that's one, in one of the chapters I sketched that out and how that took place. Okay, so how about 9-11? Basically, after 9-11, you can't have any kind of immigration reform. All right, so there's certainly some uh, value to that, to that argument. So before 9-11, the only thing a restrictionist could rely on is either economic anxiety uh, or cultural threat. And if you're someone like Pat Buchanan, you do both, right? Mm -hmm. So what 9-11 does do, it kind of helps expand the market for restrictionism, if you will, right? So it makes it more mainstream. Because all you have to say is, I, I really care about border security. That's really what I'm concerned about. And so you can mobilize people on that issue. And in fact, you see that membership in groups like Numbers USA go up after 9-11. After but Economic uh, anxiety, what do you mean by that? Economic anxiety. So it's either cost, because I haven't heard anything about fiscal cost. I've heard about, about competition. Is that what you mean by economic anxiety? This is mostly, on the, on the public opinion side, it's mostly on Jobs and wages, yeah. but not yeah. on the fiscal cost. Not, no, there's been nothing so far in your model on cost. Right. That's right. 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 Yes. Um, okay. So, so 911 provides kind of new opportunities. It provides a new dimension for restrictionism on immigration, uh, dimension on national security. Um, still, the link between terrorism and Mexican and kind of controlling the Mexican border was not apparent. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, it's it's important to say this because. What you saw on the restrictionist side, in terms of the rhetoric that was that was articulated on Blue Dobbs, but also on the congressional floor, was the importance of preventing the terrorists from cro from crossing the border, right? And how, why it was important to maintain border security, but it was very selectively invoked. It was always mentioned in terms of the U.S.-Mexico border, not the U.S.-Canadian border, nearly as much. Um, and so that connection was made rhetorically, uh, both in Congress and outside. Marta, the thing is that okay, so let me get to my model where I think. Some of these challenges do matter, but, I, but in, my, in my model, they matter in a perceptual sense. It almost doesn't matter what the truth is on the ground, whether fiscal challenges exist or not, but how it plays out in the political sphere. The perception of those is, I mean, ultimately, that's what matters for, for the political process. Whether it's real or not, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So the way that my model works is you have uh, federalism as kind of an antecedent condition, um, and then party polarization and ethnic nationalism as, as important opportunities. But then these, issue, these restrictions issue entrepreneurs play a central role in grinding action to a halt at the federal level and kind of whipping up uh, kind of the, the demand for action uh, at the subnational level, at the state and local level. So what Marta was asking before, who are these issue entrepreneurs? Right? Are, there, are there 100 of them? Is there one mean person? Who, who, who is it? So in this... Um, I, I have a very specific definition of these issue entrepreneurs, and I've identified five actors that I, that I think are central in this regard. So one is Tom Tancredo that I've talked about. Right? So Tom Tancredo, he, he's not as important today, 
but he played a central role between 2000 and, uh, and 2007. 2008, he decides to run for president, and he kind of flames out. Right? <laughs> so that's Tom Tancred, and I've talked about him quite a bit. Next is this guy. You can't see him as much. Now, this is someone who is not as well known. He actually looks a little bit like Ricky Martin. Right? So, uh, Chris no, Colson. <laughs> There's a big So Chris Kovac, uh, he's not quite a household word, and probably by design. He doesn't want to be that well known. But he's someone who, right now, is central to what is going on in Arizona, Alabama, and many of these other places. The thing about Kovac you should know is that he, so his official title, he used to be a law professor at the University of Missouri, probably one of the most powerful law professors when he, when he, was, when he was done. And now he's a Secretary of State in Kansas, right? So why is the Secretary of State in Kansas important? In fact, he's not important in Kansas. He's tried to push restrictions legislation in Kansas, and it hasn't gotten far. But he's been more successful outside of Kansas. So he helped author the Hazleton Law, yeah. mm -hmm. and the Valley Park Law, and the Farmer's Branch Law. He takes credit for the Arizona Law, and the Alabama law. In fact, it's pretty chilling in some of the research that I did on the Alabama law. He found a local, someone, you know, someone needs to push it at the local level. So in Alabama, there's a state legislator that really cared about this issue. He met uh, Kovac during some conference. And then Kovac basically went back and forth on the computer with him while this guy was in the legislature and Kovac was out duck hunting. So over a weekend duck hunting trip, he authored the Alabama law. Right? Um, this also shows that this promise of federalism of local policy experimentation that is from the ground up is not what is happening. You have a fair amount of external sponsorship, and that's why in places like Alabama you had the Chamber of Commerce, uh, agricultural interests, and even auto manufacturers up in arms after the law passing. We didn't realize that this was going to happen. Well, if you actually had a homegrown solution to a problem that exists at home, you wouldn't have had this, right? But you have something, you have someone selling something that seems very appealing, and the legislature goes for it. And the legislature goes for it in places where you have rock solid majorities of the Republican Party, right? So you don't, you don't have much in the way uh, of barriers. Finally, another individual that, that has been central. So one thing about Quebec is that his star has risen in the past five years while ten years has gone down. Someone else who used to be very big and not as big anymore, uh, is Lou Dobbs. So Lou Dobbs makes places like Hazleton a household word, and I'll say a little bit more later about, uh, about how central he was to, uh, to uh, rising, increasing the salience of these, of these local efforts. Now while individuals are important, institutions matter too. And the reason why they matter is that you can have people like Tancredo and, jo and Lou Dobbs who come and go, but groups like FAIR have been around for a while. So FAIR has been around since 1979, and uh, they play an important role, and, and, it, and I'll say a little bit more in the q and if, if I have time. They have this thing, I mean, this is another thing that's just amazing about how restrictions on immigration mobilize. So not only do they have these organizations in D.C., so FAIR and Numbers USA have D.C. offices. They also, FAIR has field offices as well. But FAIR does this thing, this annual Hold Their Feet to the Fire conference, if you will. So they invite all the conservative radio hosts to come to D.C. for a week, and do their radio shows from DC. They call it Radio Road. And in Radio Road, they bring all the restrictionist champions in Congress to come and talk about illegal immigration. This is when FAIR itself doesn't use any explicitly racial rhetoric, but its radio hosts say all sorts of stuff. Right? And it's sponsored by, by FAIR. And in addition to having these legislative champions uh, argue for the importance of, uh, of uh, immigration restriction, they also make office visits to people who are on the fence, as it were, uh, on immigration reform. Finally, Numbers USA. Uh, a lot, a lot of, even I, before I did some more in-depth research on it, thought of them as the same. But they actually have a very different operating model. They operate mostly on email, on, on faxes and phone calls. They flood the telephone lines whenever uh, legislation is being considered. I, I, I think I'm going to run out of time. So I'll just I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Bush first term and what Tancredo did. But what's important uh, is that restrictionist organizations weren't just focused on D.C. Most of the attention was on D.C., but groups like FAIR were already uh, getting involved in Iowa. Tom Vilsack was talking about a model cities program to help integrate uh, uh, immigrants coming in, mostly uh, farm workers uh, coming into the state. You also had Arizona's Prop 200 in 2004, where FAIR played a pretty central role in, in getting signatures on that ballot. This is also the time in which you had this new 
term. So um, Jennifer Chaco at the University of Irvine Law School has this neat paper when she shows that this talk about border security was post 9-11. Before it used to be called border control. But then it became border security and it just was invoked early and often whenever someone wanted to talk about immigration. During the second Bush term, you have the defeat of comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and almost simultaneously, you see the rise of Hazleton and other places. Uh, and what Ludovs does is he provides a platform for places like Hazleton. So he gives kind of legitimacy to all these kooks, if you will, uh, who, uh, who, who, uh, who are advocating for immigration restriction. But Dobbs himself also uses his, his opinions to advocate for uh, laws like Hazleton. And he also has fundraising appeals for Hazleton's legal defense fund. This goes far and beyond just you know, news, news reporting on, on the issue. Finally, in terms of security, what's important during this time is that the border now extends to sanctuary cities within the United States. So there's all this reporting about criminal, illegal criminal aliens, is what Lou Dobbs calls them. Uh, Bill O'Reilly talks about uh, these, these Mexican gangs and these Salvadoran gangs just running amok <coughs> in the United States. And uh, sanctuary city policies in places like Newark and Los Angeles uh, are threatening the security of our country. And then finally, during Obama's term, uh, this is when you see the real rise of Chris Kobach, that Romney seeks his endorsement just days before the South Carolina primary uh, to show that he's, he's one of the boys, right? Uh, that, that he can be trusted to be conservative on race issues, if you will. Um, and what happens, too, is that these organizations are explicitly identifying partisan opportunities. So Numbers USA sends out a missive that says, North Carolina is now solidly Republican uh, in its legislature and the governorship. This is a good time to do something. Mississippi is another important example, and this, I think, is going to be my favorite example for a political argument as opposed to a demographic change argument. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Mississippi, this year, there's all sorts of bills that are going to pass, right? Mm -hmm. And so someone could say, Mississippi is a new destination, and it could, you could call it a new destination, but it really stretches the notion of what a destination mm -hmm. is, right? So you do see enormous percentage growth in Mississippi, but it goes from 1% to 2% of the rental population, right? Okay? <laughs> but it's not exactly the invading horde that one imagines that is socially experienced. Invading horde. But it could be concentrated, right? In particular, the college. Yeah, but this is happening in the state. But what does happen in Mississippi that is critical this year is that the House changes from Democratic hands. For decades, this has been under Democrats. You have black Democrats in senior positions and committees killing legislation as the Senate passes it. Now they're no longer there. That's going to pass the House, and the governor is going to sign it. Right? So, Yes, you could have some concentrations, but I think it's it's stretching that argument pretty, pretty, pretty. Um, anyway, this is going to be my last slide. What are the implications of, of for scholarship on, in terms of what I'm doing? I think I have something to say to the new immigrant destinations literature to say that we need to pay attention to political institutions and dynamics. Mm -hmm. Those are important, especially when it comes to policies. I think when it comes to labor market outcomes, and even I think in terms of kind of the fiscal climate in places, you don't necessarily need to pay attention to political dynamics. Although I think in the case of fiscal climate, the institutional arrangements in terms of which level of government is responsible for what and where revenues are coming and going, I think, I think are important. But clearly, one of the things I think is important to note is that demography is not destiny. And this you know, somewhat pains me, someone who's a, who got training in demography as well, but I think that this is important. This is not just to knock, this is not to knock demography, but to push back against the sense that Diversification inevitably leads to problems. It is not the case. Political leadership is important here. And you could have had political leadership try to frame things in a different way, but they didn't. In fact, they pushed it on the other extreme. Uh, and I think for a scholarship, it's, it's also points that need to move beyond deterministic approaches. So even the kind of some of the prior work I've done to show that you know, Republican areas are more likely to do it, I think it's, kind of, it's, it's wanting. You need to have an agency-based account. Uh, you know, what kinds of actors are important, and it's important to pay attention to political dynamics uh, over time. Uh, and I think that this is important because it not only makes for good theory, but also allows for a more accurate identification of the problem. Because when it comes to looking at places that might be most vulnerable to change, or the places where one might be able to make a difference, it would be a mistake to only look at places that are diversifying demographically. One also needs to pay attention to the political context, because that's often what is important in the passage. Uh, these laws. So that's, I'll just leave it. Uh, I'll, I'll take a prerogative of saying I know there's huge interest in this subject around the table. Uh, can you 
can you refrain from making very long comments, ask questions, so that I know I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe you you are like, yeah. Go for it. Yes. Oh, I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. How do you uh, <laughs> introduce yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm Renee. I'm a fourth year student in the facility <laughs> department. Um, how can we reconcile your findings with those of Dan Hopkins? And I wonder if he has explicitly tested his, his you know, hypothesis of this interaction between demographic change and media coverage in your models. Right. I don't have media coverage in my model, but I, I think that Dan's account, I, like I said, I think it's theoretically wanting because media coverage does not occur in a vacuum. So, media co so what, what Dobbs covers, for instance, or what the national news covers, is political conflict and legislation that is being proposed. So one of the things I'll tell you, even if you look over time in public opinion, right? one of the things that's remarkable with this economic downturn is you don't see a spike in the salience of immigration, people saying that it's the most important problem, or saying that there, we, should drive, we should reduce the number of immigrants coming to this country. That does not see a, a, a bump up, and nearly not as much that happened in 1991, right? So that, but then you could say, Maybe it's media coverage that, 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 might, uh, that might be responsible there. And it's, it is true. So if you see when coverage spikes up, it, it jumps up in April 2010. What happens in April 2010? Arizona passes SB 1070, right? Media coverage goes up during that time. Right? So, that, so you can't just take media coverage as given. Just, just kind of treat it as a given and outside of the political process. So I've actually, I mean, Dan is a friend, and I'm, I'm actually in D.C. now, and I, and I talk to him, and... I'm always like saying, are you cool with what I'm saying here? And he's like, yeah, you're talking about, you know, he's largely, the way he sees it, he's, he's doing mostly work on, on the opinion side on this. But I think he could expand it even beyond that. But I think if you're looking at legislation, even he would agree that you have to adopt a more institutional approach. That, that you can't just use something like the media as, as, as standing in for so political institutions, for political process. You can do follow-up later. Thank you. There was a great question. <laughs> Rafaela Danziger, assistant professor here in politics. Um, I think this is really interesting. I'm going to make it very brief. And that is, what confuses me is that you start off by, by saying, what explains local variation? Why do some places pass it and others don't? But your answer is basically variables that are held constant nationally, right? It's a national, uh, uh, you know, a national issue, uh, a national um, political structure, polarization. And then you have these random issue entrepreneurs who come kind of from all over the place. So really what you're explaining is, Variation over time. Why now versus ten years ago? But from what you were what you were describing today, I couldn't really uh, get an explanation. You know, why a particular location versus another? I think it's fine the why now question, but the way you framed it was why one location versus another. And, and I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit more sure. about that. Sure. Yeah. No, I think uh, in that you know that's mm -hmm. it's largely because of time that I didn't go into. I mean, that mostly comes through in this kind of institutional account that. That plays out. So the places where people identify that are right for action are places that, where the partisan opportunities present themselves, and that's especially true at the state level, right? So, but even at the local level, I mean, for that, I mean, it's, it's a little bit harder to do, right? To to prove that they were scanning places to where you know Republican registration. It's not necessary. That's not the way it necessarily proceeds, right? So if there is some kind of local agitation that that prompted it. My guess would be that it would be more likely in places that are Republican heavy. That's where it seems to be happening. So in Pennsylvania, for instance, right? Hazleton did have some diversification, although there are many other places in the country that had even greater diversification. But after Hazleton passes this, there are a bunch of cities, you know, within like a 150 mile radius of Hazleton that pass it. And there's not much diversification going on. You could say it's a kind of demonstration yeah. effect, but they happen to be in kind of Republican, conservative heavy areas. Now you could say, Maybe, and I think this kind of, what does Republican stands for? I think this is where, I, you know, does it just stand for racism? Like, or is that just where the racists are, right? So that, I think, that, you know, gets, in, gets into this deep question about what party identification means. I mean, I think when you look at party identifications in the South, it's pretty clear that race is part of that. The reason why you have white Republicans is when blacks entered the Republican Party, they said, this is no longer our party, let's go join the other party, right? And so part of being Republican in the South today does involve racial conservatism that's built into it. So I think it, that works in the South. Some people say that parts of central Pennsylvania are like Alabama. So uh, maybe race helps drive that. But I think that's, so, so where location comes in is the places where the issue entrepreneurs 
um, identify as as fruitful targets. So top down. It's still from the top down. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so you have, I mean, because you have you have people that are interested in immigration throughout the country, but you don't you don't see Chris Kobach going to every single county or every single state legislature. He will go to places where it's fruitful. This also, I'll give you another example, uh, and and this, I mean, some of this. I want to refrain from just being kind of selective and anecdotal in my evidence, but I'll give you an anecdote. Um, in in uh, California, in Southern California, near where I live, in Riverside and San Bernardino counties, there have been these e-verify local e-verify ordinances that have passed, mm. and the person who's gone around sponsoring them is a Tea Party leader, and he tried pushing that in Riverside and Ontario, right? But these are Democratic-heavy areas, and he didn't get anywhere in the city councils. But he went to Temecula and Murrieta, which are in, in southern Riverside County towards San Diego, very red territory, and it passed. Not many immigrants there. So right. speaking about which, as, as you were speaking, and Krista has a question, but she's giving me permission to just make this brief intervention, because it's related to what Rafaela was just saying. I'm thinking of the map that I often have nightmares about, where it's all red. Uh, and then there are these little blue branches on yeah. the sides. I'm thinking, I'm really in the minority. So, so if you take that those aggregate data, right? There, there, the whole country is Republican, and it would not necessarily. Uh, it, it's related to what she said. It would not necessarily help us explain why some Republican areas right. uh, accept these legislation. And yeah, I've tried. Yeah, I've tried interacting demographic change with uh, parties, partisanship, and it doesn't. Pop up, and so to me, what that says is that it—you would think, right? So if yeah. it's, so, you could have a version of this kind of politicized change, where it's kind of red meat territory, red territory, and yeah. diversifying. That's where it would be most likely to happen. No, okay. let me offer my own hypothesis or part of a hypothesis. I'm not writing about this, and that is that you know, I often think of uh, of immigration as the new abortion, uh, and that's because I listen to a lot of lunatic radio. So I do know, I said, just for fun, yeah. I'm a masochist, but, but I do know that <laughs> if I were to hand it over a microphone, I could actually do exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what, what they do. And until fairly recently, indeed, after 1986 uh, and escalating up to uh, the, uh, the 2000s, uh, abortion receded as, as the central issue. The issue was not abortion or immigration. The issue is American integrity and uh, the values that really differentiate us as a nation. So people who don't even know an immigrant, I mean, I'm talking about people in South Dakota and Montana, will still get interested in immigration because it's about what Paul uh, 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 Buchanan, uh, right. Pat Buchanan uh, writes, which is about pollution and the threat to American wholesomeness. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good. I think yeah. that's a point that has to yeah, be. No, I've about, yeah, 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 and I've thought about. Yeah, yeah, I've thought about abortion, and I think there. Because one of the things, uh, especially, I mean, I have a kind of law review article with, with a colleague, and we've kind of punted on this issue of whether is there something special or different about immigration, as opposed to abortion or say guns, right? Gun legislation that is, that is pushed in there. Yeah, I think on abortion, what's interesting to me is that, especially given um, kind of Latino conservative values. Potentially, also the kind of the compassionate side of, Chris, of Christian conservatives, the kind of the George Bush compassionate conservatism. I think there potentially could have been opportunities there to not just make kind of Christian conservatism equivalent to anti-immigration, as opposed, you know, it, it makes sense on Christian conservatism why it would be anti-abortion. I think that it's it, it's a more complicated story, and I think there is some political work that happens. No, but I wasn't to make it. trying to draw attention to abortion. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to draw attention to is how these issues acquire symbolic meaning yeah. as pivots to organize national identity about right. presumed values of wholesomeness and so on and so forth. Yeah, and I so, think there's yeah, and I think actually, but on the abortion thing, I think even on the federalism story, there is a lot of parallels, especially if you see the kind of abortion restrictions that are being pushed and where they're being pushed. Yeah. And, they're being successful in places where the problem with the question right now is that it's diminishing as I'm, I'm here of, of the experts, just the cell of Messi, etc. Uh, and so now, because uh, I don't hear as much about immigration. Oh, but it, so my prediction would be if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Arizona, you'll see new, it'll, be, it'll breathe new life to these yeah. people. So I have, have two questions, and one was very much related to the previous question. Um, so, 
the first question is, <coughs> and I think this is a great sort of application of, of Kingdon and sort of this idea of political entrepreneurship from Kingdon, and I wondered if one way to sort of further substantiate the claims might be to think about sort of the opposite type of legislation and in, in which um, sort of immigrants are, are welcomed. And so we have 12 states that have passed uh, versions of the DREAM Act, yeah. and so do you, can you tell the same kind of story mm -hmm. sort of the absence of Republican leadership and entrepreneurship that helps to support that claim? And then the second, the second kind of question that was more related to what Patricia was, was mentioning is, you know, is, is this part, uh, it seems that this could be part, that this immigration sort of policy strategy from the Republican Party is part of a larger strategy overall, and that's reflected in policies such as abortion, that are sort of, and, and sort of controls on birth control that are sort of going on around the states and other reproductive health policies, as well as um, sort of other issues around health care reform and who's, which states are attempting, even though we have no idea what's going to happen with that, which states were sort of attempting to get health care reform going more quickly than others. So I think, you know, is this, uh, is this particular policy area a reflection of a broader Republican strategy instead right. of entrepreneurship? Okay. So on, um, on the first thing on, on um, kind of what's happening on the other side, one thing I should say about policy entrepreneurs, the thing I see is so a little bit different, about, and I'll, in the, in, in, I didn't have the time to do it here, but I think how issue entrepreneurs are different from policy entrepreneurs. The way Kingdom uh, conceives of it is that policy entrepreneurs are actually trying to solve actual problems, whereas issue entrepreneurs sometimes will, you know, have solutions even if there isn't a problem. Like they believe that something needs to happen, uh, and, they'll, and they'll sell it, and they're, and they're focused on that particular issue, regardless of whether there's a real problem that is, that is trying to be solved. Um, on the progressive side, um, I have looked at it on the, like I looked at sanctuary cities on the locality level, and it is. So sanctuary cities, so-called sanctuary cities, some people you know, <coughs> don't like that, even that term, um, are, uh, so the proportion of Democrats in the county uh, is predicted, right? Or the proportion of Republicans, it goes in the negative direction. Mm -hmm. So it does matter for that. I haven't done it on, on, on either DREAM Act or say in-state in tuition, right? On the in-state tuition mm -hmm. issue. Or e-verify. I mean, e-verify. I mean, yeah, because that's more restrictive. So I, I should look at it on the in-state tuition. I think on the in-state tuition, there's slightly different dynamics in terms of how overcrowded higher education is. So, I, I you know, California ultimately did pass it, um, right? But I think that it's harder to open the doors in a state like California as opposed to a state like Kansas, right? In terms of access to higher ed. But I think it's important. Uh, so this is a perfect follow to that. Actually, I was at a conference last week one of my historians of birthright citizenship, and they talked about this rise of new federalism, uh, you know, as a viable political strategy, and, you know, gay rights, the challenge of healthcare and all. The most important part of, of what these political activists are doing is that they're hoping that the Supreme Court's going to take the case and they're going to get a five to four decision in their favor. So maybe that's a... On birthright citizenship. On, on, I mean, just the general strategy. So you're talking about how it applies specifically to immigration, but political activists in general nowadays, because of the gridlock at the federal level, are basically trying this. Yeah. And that, that component of the institutional theory I mean, is expected. They want that to happen. Yeah, no, that's, no, that's a good point, too. I mean, because this, um, I mean, I don't know all the different things I could do in my book, but one of the things that's happening on immigration, so if, uh, and this is where a kind of legal constitutional law side comes in, immigration is always seen as a kind of special kind of policy where the federal government had preemption. The federal government, it's, it's part of its treaty-making powers with other countries, that you can't have a patchwork of policies on immigration. And that's what the Department of Justice is saying. Arizona fundamentally threatens the special place the federal government has on immigration. If the Supreme Court takes that down, it makes immigration just like any other, any other policy. There's nothing special about immigration. So I think that's, yeah, that, that, that's good and important to know that if, if the Supreme Court backs Arizona in this case. It's not just on the substantive ground, but for federalism, it would be a fundamental shift in terms of business. Hogan, did you have a question that she asked in the middle? Oh, right. Oh, on 287G. Right, so Arizona's law, 
what Arizona, so on the face of it, what Arizona, what Arizona says, what Kovac has written it in a way that what Arizona is doing is just what they've always done under 287, most, part, most, most law enforcement jurisdictions in Arizona did under 287G, right? So they could identify, they could, they could identify people who are suspected of being in the country illegally, and there's a big debate of how do you identify that? They look at, you know, if you too many people in the car, if your clothes are a little messy, and people have come up with all sorts of jokes about what that, what that might entail. But, uh, but that, so what they are saying is we're just doing what we've always been able to do. What's also important to note about the federal challenge to Arizona's law is that they are not challenging it on racial profiling grounds. One, because it hasn't taken effect. But two, because the federal government racially profiles all the time when it does its border enforcement. So they can't say it's unconstitutional to racially profile someone in, in the course of, of doing immigration enforcement. So that's not what the federal government is, is uh, attacking Arizona with the It's on this preemption ground. Basically, they're saying it matters whether we grant you the authority to do it or not. You can't just do the same thing that you always did under a federal program, but then do it on your own. You don't make the rules, we make the rules. Are there other questions? Yes, please. Given a receptive polity, if you look at your economic data uh, slightly differently, would you be willing to give a higher value to the economic part in terms of uh, its impact? If you look at the data you presented from 2005 to 2007, before the denouement of 2008, that's a perfect mirror of the bubble economy, which hollowed out the economy of the working class in many of these districts. Right. No, I think, yeah, I think um, I have a student who's actually, I mean, she's kind of, uh, so she's my advisee, but she's going to, she's doing some of this research that challenges what I'm saying, which is, she's going to, she's going to look at um, foreclosure data, housing foreclosure data, and also um, change in property values. Because I told her to look at change in property values too, right? Because even though back then, you might not have had that many households that had undergone foreclosure, you might have effects on the neighborhoods and, 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 and these So I think that there could be something there. I would still maintain, for me, you know, in fact, if ultimately demographic change or even some of these economic factors uh, end up being significant, Kind of like I guess theoretically, I still think that you you are talking about political outcomes where politics has to come in at some stage in that process. I guess what I'm pushing back against is this kind of just these. I mean, so uh, even Kingdon is opposed to this idea that problems that just present themselves and they naturally translate into uh, legislation. Usually, there's a lot of things that need to happen before some before problems crop up and for legislation too. But you're not saying, saying you're not saying that uh, demographic change doesn't matter, or that there may be some very small pockets, by the way, because even quote conservative researchers like George Borjas has not found that competition between immigrants and native-born citizens is all that significant in terms of determining attitudes uh, towards immigrants. But but you're not saying that economic factors completely don't matter or that demographic factors, I mean, sure, you know, you get two immigrants who look different in a small town in Mississippi. It's going to be very scary to some people, okay? Uh, so, so it matters, but, but I think you're right that it's the institutions and the political structures that have not been sufficiently uh, taken into account. I, I guess I, part of, in the strong version of my argument, I'm saying that somebody, I mean, so if you even look at kind of the, the number of municipalities that have passed these laws, right? So it's, it's even the ones that are considered, I mean, right now I'm actually trying to figure out if there's been any update in terms of the number of municipalities that have passed it that have considered it before, but it's about 100. You have like 25,000 municipalities. Here in New Jersey, I would just start to remember. Riverside, New Jersey. You passed something and then it went back. Because even in this very blue state, we've right. had that debate at the local level. Right. And uh, I would be very interested in going back and, and checking. That. Yeah, so, so there's this, yeah, this case, I mean, because I teach at UC Riverside, when, when this town, Riverside, New Jersey, popped up, that was curious, interesting to me. That's a place that passed it, and then their uh, downtown business district just disappeared. Because yeah. mm. it was mostly immigrant-run businesses. And they said, oh, okay, maybe this is not good for a local 
So we have one last question. I just have one last comment. I hope that your slide with Obama term one accurately suggests that there'll be an Obama term two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the one, the, the one thing I should say about Obama, though, the, which actually, I mean, this is something, I'm not saying that Democrats are necessarily that great when it comes to immigration. So it is true that the number of deportations have reached record highs under the Obama administration, the have secure communities that have been rolled out. So in some ways, you know, and this, is a, this is for another project, and there's been work on looking at African Americans in the 80s and 90s, talking about them as a captured minority, politically captured minority. And in many ways, Latinos seem to fit that profile, in which Democrats use them in very convenient ways to try to move. Harry Reid, for instance, was going to be defeated and relied on the Latino vote. Yes. You know, it was like an 85 to 15 percent spread. Yeah. Um, and Obama's going to do something very similar, but is he a friend of immigrants? It's hard. It's hard to. <laughs> <make>. <laughs> Uh, I think that we have to stop, but you know, it's been a fabulous presentation, very thought provoking. Thank you very much. State um, National Asian American Survey, uh, which is the first of its kind conducted at the national level. Uh, today, uh, he will be sharing a presentation with us entitled Polarized Change the politicization of the United States immigration at the state uh, and local levels. We want to welcome you most heartily. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. It's, uh, I'm humbled at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the level of interest. Um, the title I have here is uh, slightly different. And in fact, one of the things that I should say is that if anyone has to, um, Usually pretty good at coming up with labels and titles, but I'm still trying to wrestle with both the title for the book, um, uh, which you see here, that's a tentative title, and also for the model that I'm going to sketch out. I'm not wedded to any of these particular labels, so if someone has some better ideas, I'd be glad to hear it. Um, and if you don't have a chance to, uh, uh, and if you don't have too much time for discussion today, just email me, karthik at ucr.edu, um, or, uh, or or I'll give you my phone number if you want to talk about something. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I think we just have an hour total, right? right. If you deliver a 40 minute presentation, we'll have plenty of time. Okay. Okay. I'll just say a little bit about uh, how I got to this topic. So, most of the work that I do, the, I mean, so I, I, I did my um, graduate work here at, at Princeton and, and uh, started off doing work on political behavior and civic participation. So that's what I started my research trajectory on. It becomes enshrined in the, in the national imagination, especially among Latino immigrants. Um, soon after this passed, you had a massive wave of protests uh, in uh, early 2006. In 2006, you also had attempts at comprehensive immigration reform, and it failed. It also failed in 2007 when they tried again. Now, in addition to this national picture, you also saw a spike in involvement in uh, local involvement in immigration enforcement. Again, here's another number, uh, part of the immigration code that typically would not get much notice, but this is a program that, that allows cooperation between the federal government and uh, state and local law enforcement authorities uh, through this provision called 287G, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, and we can talk about it in the Q&A. Now, in addition to this, this federal state program, you saw the rise of local legislation uh, after 2005. Uh, the first and most prominent one was in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. A place, again, a place you would never have heard of, except for the fact that it passed this thing and got on the Lou Dobbs show uh, several times. Uh, soon after Hazleton passed this ordinance, you had Valley Park, Missouri, and former French Texas, passing legislation that looked <coughs> nearly identical, very similar, quite sophisticated uh, in terms of uh, wording it in such a way to potentially pass constitutional muster. Hazleton right now, has, is being getting kicked around up and down the, uh, the, uh, the circuit courts. Uh, and will probably make it to the Supreme Court. Uh, as you might know, Arizona's SB 1070 uh, is going to have oral arguments uh, on that um, next, actually, April 25th. And hopefully the uh, federal government will have a better argument than the uh, Sasha Kranich, uh, whose presentation on whatever subject he chooses, actually, it's on uh, Zapotecs and Mishteks in the United States and in their places of origin. The title has already been sent to the organizer. 
and, that would, and mines from Shabbat. That would be me, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and it will be sent to you. And, and he will be speaking at this very place, <coughs> at this very time, on May 3rd. So maybe you want to uh, make a note of it. Uh, on uh, April 19, Mark Helbling uh, will be speaking on how political actors frame, frame immigration in Western Europe, always an important subject. And finally, we'll close uh, with a golden brooch, as we say in underdeveloped countries, uh, with a talk by Irene Blumbrad, uh, Reconciling Diversity and Democracy, the Process and Policies of Immigrant Political Incorporation. It's very exciting. So it would be great uh, if you could join us then as well. Today it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Professor Karthik Ramakrishnan, who lives uh, at the Political Science Department at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, and considering our turnout, I can see that everybody here is acquainted with his very important research on civic participation, immigration policy, and the politics of race and ethnicity and immigration in the United States. Uh, he's also one of the principal investigators of the 2000. Um, after that, after being here, I went to work at the Public Policy Institute of California, and there I was starting to think more about policy issues, and that's how I got interested in this topic of local governments and what they do or don't do uh, with respect to immigrant incorporation. Now, this was back in the early aughts, I guess, in, in 2002 and 2003. And so back then, the discussion was, you know, what are lo local governments doing to try to integrate immigrants? And, and what I did there was to do a study that involved a survey of immigrant destination cities in California. Um, and California being what it is, you have about 300 cities where, uh, where about one in six residents is, is foreign born. Uh, this is as of the 2000 census. So we did a survey of uh, elected of government officials in these cities. So we surveyed city council members, mayors, police chiefs, and planning directors. We focused on police chiefs and planning directors, one, because of potential issues with, in terms of community police relations involving immigrants. Um, in terms of planning directors, this involves land use, but also issues such as overcrowded housing, which even then people were saying was more likely to be the case in immigrant-heavy neighborhoods. One of the things we wanted to find out is how good are these cities in terms of considering the needs uh, and addressing the concerns of immigrant residents, how much language access do they provide, what kind of avenues to political power are there for immigrants, and largely the story was a fairly depressing one. Um, even though, and we, and I should say we also did case studies in four cities in California, some qualitative work to kind of help add some flesh to the statistical findings. And generally speaking, and this report is um, you can find it on my website or, uh, or on the PPIC website. Um, we generally found that even in these immigrant destination cities, when you go outside the very large cities, like Los Angeles, like San Jose, um, like uh, Santa Ana, there's not much that's going on. Um, even though, I mean, and this is where you have this disconnect. This ties into some of the research that, I'm, that I've done with Irene Blumrad, uh, too, which you, you have this disconnect between an increasing vibrancy in immigrant civic associational life, but a disconnect between uh, the avenues of power and what's going on within immigrant communities. Um, so, uh, you know, but it, we have the strong contrast. On the one hand, you have the Rotary Club and the Lions Club that are still very much powerful when it comes to local politics. Um, you know, we typically think of employee unions as being very strong, but in most of these suburban cities, they, they're not strong, they don't exist in many of these places. Um, but by contrast, immigrant-heavy uh, uh, civic associations are not politically powerful. So that's what we found, but generally the thrust was, what can cities do to be more welcoming, more integrative? Uh, so that report came out in 2005. Um, a lot has changed since then. Right? So the entire angle has shifted uh, in, into now when you're looking at how immigrants are being treated at the local level and the state level. It's mostly to figure out who, uh, who is doing what to um, to, to uh, hurt immigrants, I guess, to put it most bluntly. Uh, you've seen a rise in restrictive efforts. Um, first, at the national level, uh, as many of you know, uh, in December 2005, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, passed a, a, a bill known as H.R. 4437. It's one of these few instances where a, a bill number itself be, 